The topic of the screencast is gas exchange and transport. You may find information on this topic in Chapter 13 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Explain partial pressure and its effects on the diffusion of a gas. Describe external gas exchange. Describe internal gas exchange. Identify the form and location in which oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood. Explain how carbon dioxide levels affect pH. Define hemoglobin saturation. And list the factors that can increase oxygen unloading. I want to return to this figure which illustrates yet again the five processes that are involved in respiration. Pulmonary ventilation, external gas exchange, gas transport, internal gas exchange, and cellular respiration. We discussed pulmonary ventilation in the previous screencast, and cellular respiration will be covered in a future chapter. Now I'd like to focus on external gas exchange, gas transport, and internal gas exchange. We learned in a previous screencast the role of pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation continually refreshes the air in the alveoli. And why is this important? This is important to support external respiration or external gas exchange. That is the gas exchange that occurs across the respiratory membrane between blood in the pulmonary capillaries and air in the alveoli. Carbon dioxide and oxygen diffuse down their pressure gradients. Pulmonary ventilation ensures that there is adequate pressure gradient between the blood and the pulmonary capillaries and air in the alveoli. Carbon dioxide is unloaded from the pulmonary capillaries and oxygen is loaded onto the pulmonary capillaries, both gases moving down their pressure gradients. This oxygenated blood, now high in oxygen and low in carbon dioxide, is then transported to the left side of the heart and then transported to the systemic capillaries. In the systemic capillaries, we have opposite pressure gradients compared to the pulmonary capillaries. Oxygen is going to be unloaded from the blood of the systemic capillaries, moving down its pressure gradient, and carbon dioxide will be loaded onto the blood of the systemic capillaries, also moving down its concentration gradient. That is a broad overview of gas exchange and transport. Now let's look at the details of these three processes. The movement of a specific gas from one location to another is determined by the pressure gradient that exists for that specific gas. The pressure of a specific gas is referred to as its partial pressure. We can calculate the partial pressure for a gas in the atmosphere by taking atmospheric pressure and multiplying it by the value for the percentage of the gas in the air. For example, we can calculate the partial pressure of oxygen in atmospheric air by taking atmospheric pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, and multiplying it by the percentage oxygen in atmospheric air, which is 20.9%. So we get a partial pressure of oxygen of 159 millimeters of Hg, or mercury. We can do the same thing for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is less than four hundredths of a percent uh, in atmospheric air, so we get a partial pressure of three millimeters of mercury for carbon dioxide. When we are considering the partial pressure of a gas within a liquid, we also have to consider the solubility of the specific gas in the specific liquid. Since we're talking about the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide in blood, and blood is 50% water, 
roughly, we have to consider the solubilities of carbon dioxide and oxygen in water. Carbon dioxide is much more soluble than oxygen is in water. Therefore, it takes a greater concentration of carbon dioxide in water to obtain a partial pressure equal to that of oxygen. In other words, water is less willing to give up carbon dioxide molecules than it is oxygen molecules. So it takes more carbon dioxide molecules in water to obtain the same partial pressure. This is illustrated on the figure to the right. Here we have a container of water with equal partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide. But look closely and you'll notice it takes twice as many carbon dioxide molecules shown in green than it does oxygen molecules shown in sort of the reddish orange to obtain equal partial pressures. During external gas exchange, oxygen is loaded onto the blood of the pulmonary capillaries and carbon dioxide is unloaded. This process occurs by the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide from high partial pressures to low partial pressures. The process of diffusion across the respiratory membrane is dependent on two main factors, the partial pressure gradient across the respiratory membrane and the health of the lung tissue. Now let's look at external gas exchange, that is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide across the respiratory membrane. The partial pressure of oxygen is significantly higher in the alveoli than it is in blood arriving from the pulmonary arteries. Therefore, oxygen diffuses down its partial pressure gradient and is loaded into the blood of the pulmonary capillaries. The opposite gradient exists for carbon dioxide. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is greater in blood arriving from the pulmonary capillaries than it is in the alveoli. Therefore, carbon dioxide also diffuses down its pressure gradient and the blood is unloaded of carbon dioxide. Both oxygen and carbon dioxide levels quickly reach equilibrium between the air in the alveoli and the blood in the pulmonary capillaries, such that blood leaving via the pulmonary veins has the same partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide as the air in the alveoli. During external respiration, oxygen is loaded into the blood. Oxygen first moves into the plasma, and then 99% of the oxygen moves into red blood cells where it binds to an iron-containing protein called hemoglobin. This forms oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin emits a red color, and for that reason, oxygenated blood, or blood that is oxygen-rich, appears a very bright scarlet red. This oxygenated blood is then transported by the cardiovascular system to the systemic capillaries. At the systemic capillaries, the partial pressure of oxygen is greater in the blood than it is in the interstitial fluid of the body tissues. Therefore, oxygen is released from the hemoglobin inside the red blood cells, enters the plasma, and then diffuses down its partial pressure gradient into the interstitial fluid of the capillaries, excuse me, interstitial fluid of the body tissues. This is internal gas exchange or internal respiration. Equilibrium between the partial pressure of oxygen in the systemic capillaries and the interstitial fluid is reached very quickly such that as oxygen poor blood leaves the systemic capillaries in the venules, the partial pressure of oxygen in the venules is equal to the partial pressure of oxygen in the interstitial fluid. This deoxygenated blood or oxygen-poor blood 
is a darker shade of red compared to the oxygenated blood. Hemoglobin saturation refers to the percentage of oxygen binding sites on the hemoglobin molecules that are actually occupied by an oxygen molecule. Hemoglobin saturation peaks at 98% in pulmonary capillaries and then drops to a minimum of around 45% in systemic capillaries. There are several physical conditions that can increase the unloading of oxygen from the blood in the systemic capillaries. These conditions occur when there is an increase in metabolism, a decrease in pH, an increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, as well as an increase in temperature can all increase the amount of oxygen unloaded from the blood in the systemic capillaries. During internal gas exchange or internal respiration, while oxygen is being unloaded from the blood, carbon dioxide is being loaded into the blood, moving down its partial pressure gradient from the interstitial fluid into the blood of the systemic capillaries. There, a small amount of carbon dioxide enters the plasma, but most carbon dioxide enters the red blood cells. There, a small amount binds to hemoglobin, a different site on the hemoglobin molecule than oxygen, so it doesn't interfere with the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. But most of the carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid, and then the carbonic acid dissociates into bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. So most of the carbon dioxide in blood circulates in the form of bicarbonate. Also note that as the carbon dioxide content of blood increases, the pH of the blood decreases because as carbon dioxide levels increase, the hydrogen ion content of the blood increases as well. The deoxygenated blood, when it leaves the systemic capillaries, notice that it has the same partial pressure of carbon dioxide as the interstitial fluid because the blood of the systemic capillaries reaches equilibrium with the interstitial fluid in terms of the content of carbon dioxide or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. That deoxygenated blood is then transported to the pulmonary capillaries where the carbon dioxide is reformed from bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ions and then diffuses down its partial pressure gradient into the alveoli during external respiration as previously described. Now let's review. The objectives of the screencast. Explain partial pressure and its effects on the diffusion of a gas. Describe external gas exchange. Describe internal gas exchange. Identify the form and location in which oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in blood. Explain how carbon dioxide levels affect pH. Define hemoglobin saturation. And finally, list the physical factors that can increase oxygen unloading. The topic of the next screencast will be control of respiration.